Okay, uh, hello everybody. My name is Dylan Corbett and I'm the Executive Director of the Hope Border Institute. Uh, you're, we're coming to you from El Paso, Texas, uh, which is a border community uh, in West Texas. We're on the border with Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. Um, we have a large binational population here, and this is probably the largest binational community perhaps in the world. Um, and it's a bilingual community. And today uh, we're coming to you to talk about uh, a pastoral letter uh, that's been signed by the Bishop of El Paso, who's joining me, Bishop Mark Seitz. The pastoral letter you received yesterday, um, interesting for a couple of points, I'll allow the Bishop to talk about it, but it's the first uh, pastoral letter on immigration from the diocesan bishop in almost a decade. And it's the first pastoral letter from a, from a sitting bishop that addresses the theme of the border and militarization, the militarization of the border. Uh, so it's interesting for, for a variety of reasons. Um, we'll allow the bishop to speak more about it. Um, what he'll do is he'll talk to you a little bit about the pastoral, a little bit about why he wrote, decided to wrote the pastoral, write the pastoral, um, some of the implications, uh, policy implications, pastoral implications, um, his vision for it, and then we'll take your questions. Um, so thank you for joining us. Uh, thanks to Chris and the Ignatian Solidarity Network for, for hosting us on the Zoom call. And um, I'll turn it over to Bishop. Bishop Seitz, thank you. Well, good morning, or should I say good afternoon to many of you who are listening. I'm really delighted uh, and honored that y'all have taken this interest in, in the letter and uh, happy to share with you my thoughts and respond to any questions that you might have about the pastoral letter. First of all, let me say this is not intended to be, in the first instance, a political document. It, it is a reflection based on the light of faith. Uh, that uh, I think is my responsibility as, as bishop to analyze uh, how we are responding to the gospel call in, in light of the signs of the times. And uh, so that's what, what I've attempted to do. We take as a, a uh, kind of guiding scripture a passage you don't often hear associated with these questions. It's from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 35, where he says, the burning sands will become pools and the thirsty ground springs of water and the ransomed of the Lord shall enter Zion singing, crowned with everlasting joy. They meet with joy and gladness, sorrow and mourning flee away. So we've taken that text and uh, use that as a background for our reflection because uh, the, our faith should always give us hope, even in, when the situation seems overwhelming and, um, and um, you know, uh, when we feel like we have no power to change the situation, God is present in it. And one of the main groups I wanted to speak to here uh, I'm addressing this letter primarily to the people of my diocese, but in a special way to our migrant community who are living in a great deal of fear right now, uh, who need to hear that they are not alone, uh, that God is with them, that he can change those dry sands into springs and, and pools of water, that, that God can also invite us into union with each other, uh, those of us who are called to leadership in the church, those of us who are simply members of this community need to recognize that these are our brothers and sisters. So that's a primary uh, principle of the document. Um, we acknowledge with something which I think just about everyone would agree on, and that is that our is broken, that it, it really, uh, we need comprehensive immigration reform, and it's way overdue. And, and, but for now, while we have this broken system, which divides families, which detains human beings for profit, which compromises our nation's commitment, age-old commitment to the refugee and asylum seeker, as well as the immigrant, which militarizes our communities here on the border and forces people to their death in the desert, um, we need to respond as a Catholic community to these situations and do all that we can, as Pope Francis has called us to, uh, with, with such 
uh, pers uh, persistence, we need to accompany people in, in these struggles. Um, the the um, letter points out that, um, th that building walls and deploying a, a mass deportation force and listing all of our local police uh, to, to continue this, uh, this work and leave aside so many gains that they've had by developing a, a truly trustworthy community policing effort. Uh, these things are not going to make the situation better, but they're going to have um, a, terrible, uh, a, a terrible impact on our migrant community and frankly, all of us, because they're, they're part of us. Um, in the pastoral letter, I'm suggesting a number of initiatives on the part of our diocese. Uh, firstly, I'm creating a commission on migration. And um, this commission will be made up of priests and lay leaders in our diocese to uh, continue to look at, at the church's response. I, I see this letter not as a one-time shot across the bow sort of thing, but as the beginning in a certain way of a more uh, committed effort to serve our migrant community. So our diocesan commission will serve that purpose. I'm establishing a new fund that we're calling the Soñador Fund. Uh, it is uh, a fund that will be managed by our Catholic foundation in the diocese uh, to provide scholarships for dreamer children. Uh, they're the most innocent among the innocent and um, we're mortified by the threats that are being expressed towards them. Uh, we believe that by helping to provide a Catholic education, we can really give them a, a hand up and, and out of uh, the poverty that many of them experience. I'm also establishing uh, uh, an intensive program of formation that will be directed by our Tepeyac Institute in union with our Hope Border Institute. Uh, to form leaders in migrant ministry and in immigration advocacy here in El Paso. Among those efforts, we are envisioning a rapid response team as other places have done, so that um, when uh, a person and his family feel, feel threatened, say there are immigration officers at the door, they can make a phone call and, and within minutes, uh, members of this team can be there to support and help them. Uh, you know, not not in a uh, not using violence, of course, but um, but just helping to to be serve as a liaison with immigration authorities and and also uh, recording what's taking place. Uh, we are also uh, uh, asking the or our uh, diocesan attorneys to develop a policy memorandum that will go to all of our pastors, instructing them on, on their rights if immigration uh, uh, officials should, should come seeking to do some kind of enforcement action at their parish, to remind them that uh, we are not going to invite immigration authorities onto our property unless they have a search warrant or if they're responding to an urgent uh, emergency uh, situation in the parish. We're also uh, calling for a moratorium on immigration detention and deportation. Given the broken immigration system we have, uh, we, we don't believe it makes sense. It is not right to, to be uh, summarily returning uh, people who have fled here back into the very situation that they fled. Uh, there should not be a de facto uh, death penalty given to people whose only crime, if you will, it's not, a, it's not a crime at all, who have simply crossed our border without documents and who should, in fact, be receiving refuge in our country, asylum. So those are some of the main points of our document. So, so I, 
are there any any questions anything that you would like us to follow up on a little bit more <clears throat> bishop mark i just i just submitted a question here uh to christopher would you like me to read it or or, or can you see it or yeah would you read it please yes and it's a pleasure uh, to meet you, by the way. very nice to meet you too very nice to meet you and thank you for the beautiful document um, I, I was just interested um, in the relationship between this document and Pope Francis's visit in February last year. I was in Ciudad Juarez on the other side of the wall at the Mass. Um, how much has Pope Francis's own testimony on this issue emboldened you uh, to produce this? Um, how significant was the timing and the nature of that visit? given everything that happened afterwards with the, with the election of Donald Trump and the threat of the wall. And, and finally, are there any plans for future statements or initiatives that go all the way along the border that you do in conjunction with your other, with your brother bishops on the border? Because I know you have a lot of cooperation uh, and whether there indeed there are any plans for, tr for cross border uh, initiatives in response to, to this current climate as, as you describe it, of fear and militarization. Well, thank okay. you very much. So thank you. In regards to the first part of your question, uh, Pope Francis, uh, I think it's somewhat obvious, uh, he, he is a, a huge inspiration to all of us in this area. And um, the very fact that he chose to come to, to our border region and to celebrate a mass, and he's the one that wanted that, that mass to be on the border, not somewhere south uh, in, in Ciudad Juarez, but, but actually on the border. Uh, and that was his desire. So um, it was a day of great inspiration. Actually, the border bishops invited him before he came to the United States, and uh, we believe that he had that in mind when he uh, chose to, to come to, to our region. Uh, so he, he's quoted often in our pastoral letter, in the pastoral letter, and uh, uh, he's a great inspiration. Uh, in regard to the border bishops, yes, there, the bishops along the border of Texas and Mexico have been meeting for well over 20 years, uh, twice a year. So there's a great commitment there, and we have a great sense of fraternity and cooperation. Uh, a pastoral letter has already come from that group. It was called Strangers No Longer. They issued that document, and then it was taken up by the Episcopal Conferences of Mexico and the United States. I forget what year that was, but um, uh, not all that long ago, 10 or 15 years. So uh, the, we're meeting actually in the beginning of September, and this meeting will take in the entire 2,000 miles of the border. All of the bishops on both sides of the border are being invited to this meeting in Piedras Negras, uh, southwest of San Antonio. Uh, so I don't know that a document will come from it, but um, Usually there is a statement, at least a brief statement, that comes from that gathering. And it's obviously a very significant time for us to be talking about life on the border and the impact of various kinds of enforcement actions. Thank you. If I could just follow up, it was just really to wonder, and thank you for that, for that wonderful answer, but uh, whether the initiatives that you've introduced in the diocese, whether there are any plans for other bishops in other dioceses to do the same, which would, of course, multiply the impact of them. Uh, as an Right. I, I lost the sound there, Austin. Uh, I, it's because I had it on mute. Excuse me. Uh, Sorry, it was, it, was just, it was just one, whether the initiatives that you've taken uh, and you've announced today in this document, whether those initiatives have also been taken by your brother bishops along the border, or whether they have plans to do the same. In other words, is there a plan to multiply these initiatives, which would, of course, have a, have a great impact? Yes, well, many of the border bishops and, and other bishops from throughout the country have spoken very strongly on these issues as I'm sure you're aware, one of my uh, guiding lights has been Archbishop Gomez in LA, uh, but many others, Bishop Flores in Brownsville and, and Bishop Cantu in my neighbor diocese, Las Cruces. 
as uh, Dylan mentioned at the outset, uh, surprisingly, there have not been pastoral letters written on this issue recently. And uh, maybe this will be a little bit of um, an incentive. Uh, maybe this will stir the pot a little bit and um, clear the way for, for us to speak out uh, more and within our own particular diocese on this, on this issue. Uh, we have a question from uh, Eli McCarthy. Bishop, he wants to um, perhaps, if you could speak a little bit about the distinction between sanctuary and how uh, the message that you're sending to Border Patrol and Immigration and Customs Enforcement regarding enforcement actions uh, in churches and on church premises and school premises. Could you speak a little bit more about that? Yeah. You know, there are certain words I feel sorry for, and sanctuary is one of them. The great word with a great history, right? But unfortunately, it, it has been uh, uh, reinterpreted by, by many and misunderstood by many. Uh, but uh, the, I think probably the main way from the traditional understanding of, of sanctuary is that I'm not proposing that we house uh, migrants and, and refugees who are being pursued by Border Patrol or ICE. Uh, what I'm saying is that we, we should recognize what rights we have and exercise them. Uh, we, we don't have to give permission to um, enforcement actions to, to come to our churches. We have not had that happen yet, but we just want to make sure that we lay the groundwork and that it's clear with all of our pastors should anything like this take place. Uh, we're hoping that, the, that ICE will continue to uh, abide by its um, uh, uh, secure, what, what do they call it, secure locations policy. Uh, but um, I, I don't see sanctuary as a course that we should be taking at least at this time. Uh, one of the main reasons is I don't think it helps the immigrant that would be, would be housed there. It, it simply points them out to the authorities uh, and um, uh, creates a situation in which it's not likely they will Th there will be a good outcome. Uh, so we're talking about remaining within, within the law, but using the rights that we have within that law. Bishop, uh, you're, in your letter, you're also, um, you have a unique statement about um, calling for a moratorium on immigrant detention and on deportation. Um, that's a stand that's been taken uh, in the last couple of months by Archbishop, Archbishop Jose Gomez. Can you talk about why you thought it was important to reiterate that and, and uh, your vision for that and how you think that that challenge might be taken up by, by the church across the country? You know, it's interesting how sometimes we tend to take the status quo as though it were the way that things have to be. In a sense, I've, I've been so used to the fact that we deport people that are caught uh, who don't have documents that I, I haven't really stepped back and reflect on it and I appreciate it. Archbishop Gomez uh, making this suggestion. And, and uh, I, I think it would be helpful if, if more of us, uh, leaders in the church and beyond the church, would be recommending this course of action, especially as we deal with a broken immigration system. Uh, we hear so many stories about immigrants being pressured heavily to sign papers that they don't even uh, uh, recognize, uh, you know, what they're about, uh, that, that call for rapid deportation. We see situations where people have fled, and, and frankly, the vast majority of the, those who have crossed our border here at El Paso in recent years are not people who have left simply because they think they can get a higher paying job here. They have fled uh, threats against their lives and the lives of their family. Uh, they've sold everything they had in order to get here. And then to deport them back into that situation, uh, as, as I've said, it, it is in a certain sense uh, asking them to pay for, for their crossing uh, with 
what potentially ends up being a death penalty. Uh, and uh, that is certainly not right. You know, our country helped write the laws on asylum, and we've expected other countries to practice them. And places like Lebanon and Jordan have accepted as much as half again as much of their population in refugees. But when mere tens of thousands come to our border, uh, a, 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 a small, a minuscule proportion to our population, to the richest nation in the country, somehow we don't think that those laws should, uh, uh, of asylum should apply to us. And frankly, those laws are outdated as well. They need to be rewritten to respond to the situation that people are experiencing in, in Central America and Mexico, where the government simply isn't able to protect them. Bishop, this is a question from Chris uh, over at ASN. Could you share a story of someone uh, here in the diocese that, um, or someone you've encountered uh, that illustrates the reality of our broken immigration system? Well, there are many stories. I share a couple of them in my, uh, in my document, but I'll give you one that's not mentioned there. I was hoping that a man by the name of Carlos Gutierrez and his family would be able to be here today. Uh, Carlos is a young man. He's probably in his mid-30s right now. Uh, about um, eight years ago, something like that, uh, he was uh, a very successful businessman in Chihuahua. Uh, uh, the ruling gang in Chihuahua, and they're usually connected to narco traffickers also, uh, they started uh, extorting funds from him, from his businesses. It came to the point where he could no longer sustain the payments they were demanding. Uh, he's married, has... Uh, two children, two young children. And um, uh, so one day when he was gathered with friends in the park, some uh, people drove up, threw him into the back of an SUV, used a machete to cut off his legs. Um, he survived that attack. And uh, as soon as he was able to, of course, he left with his family and came to El Paso. For these last however many years, I guess it's five to eight years, he has been in the process seeking asylum and has not successfully received it yet. Uh, what is wrong with a system that would send a man back who has lost both of his legs uh, to, to the very place where, where they did that to, them, to him? Um, it, it's clearly a broken system. We've got a question from uh, Mar Munoz from the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. Hello, Mar. Bishop, uh, thank you for highlighting the border as a place of hope and faith enriched by migration and diversity. Can you speak more to the gifts that immigrants bring to the diocese and the response of the local community to the current anti-immigrant rhetoric? Thank you. You know, that's something we felt that we here on the border could bring to the discussion even more effectively than other places. Uh, we are a community of migrants. Uh, that is our uh, makeup, our, our reality. And uh, it, it's interesting that contrary to the narratives that many times we hear, uh, El Paso is, is listed as the safest city of its size in the United States. Um, it is the safest city in the United States, not despite the migrants, but because of the presence of migrants in large measure who have who are peaceful, loving, community-oriented people. And I think it's also in part because we've developed a very successful community policing uh, model here in which people feel safe uh, dealing with our local police, even if they don't have documents. Uh, we fear that that might be changing with the passage of SB4, which um, seeks to enlist uh, local law enforcement as also immigration officers. Uh, but that's maybe another question. Uh, but no, uh, how the, the tremendous work ethic of the 
migrant community, the uh, sense of family and community, the values of, of faith uh, that they bring are, are something that enriches us and teaches us. Uh, I feel so blessed to be here on the border in this migrant community. Uh, this is a question from California, from Greg Walgenbach in the Diocese of Orange. Uh, Bishop, good to see you again. The political view, the political culture loves to use uh, issues like immigration as wedges to break up the solidarity to which we aspire as a Catholic community. What suggestions do you have to help the Catholic community resist the false choice which our political culture offers? And how can we grow in solidarity and compassion in the face of the resurgent nativism today? Well, where to start? I start with the gospel, I think. You know, uh, there's, there's so much richness in the gospel that, that call out, calls us beyond those things that, that would divide us. Uh, I think something else that we need to pursue, um, and I think it's effectively happening here in El Paso to a large degree, but I've seen the need for it elsewhere, is that we need to somehow open up the doors of communication between the Anglo community in, uh, that is dominant in so many places in our country with the immigrant community, whether they be Hispanic or, or from another place. Uh, there's too, there are too many ghettos in our country still. Um, we need to open up the doors. We need to find structures that bring communities together. We need to worship together whenever possible. We need to, need to gather them together for meals and so on. And once you accomplish that, the whole narrative changes uh, and people recognize the value uh, that we have, uh, that we find in this diversity uh, that really makes us Catholic in a certain sense. A bishop, you're, you're a bishop here in Texas, um, and the Attorney General of Texas is one of the Attorney Generals who, Attorneys General who's joined uh, public officials from states across the country uh, threatening to sue the Trump administration if they don't roll back protections for dreamers. Um, you took a pretty strong position comparing those who would support rolling back those protections uh, to scribes and Pharisees. Can you talk about why you took such a strong position, why you thought that was a such an important issue to, uh, to uh, raise your voice on? I was mortified to hear their, the statement of our attorneys general. Uh, you know, I'll just tell you what my guttural reaction was when I first heard that. I felt like uh, the, the bullies on the playground had decided they were gonna go after the littlest kids. You know, uh, that's what it, it felt like to me. And, and I don't think that's too far from the truth. Uh, we have already placed in, in fear our migrant communities. Uh, it, it's bad enough that innocent adults who are working and contributing and doing their best uh, in this country uh, should be put under this threat. But really, did we have to go after the kids too? Uh, even this administration, which has uh, spoken such negative words towards the, the immigrant community, stopped when it came to that point uh, of um, removing protections from, from dreamers. Um, I thought it was, uh, as I reflected on it in, in the light of faith, the same sort of thing that really made Jesus angry too. And um, it, it's exactly what he was talking about because what they're basically saying, as I understand it is, well, it's the law, you know, and um, they are seeking to apply the minutiae uh, of the law. And as Jesus says, a place heavy burdens on the poor, burdens that they are unwilling to carry themselves. Um, it made Jesus angry, and, and so maybe it should make us angry too. A uh, question from Lani Ellis. Uh, Bishop, can you paint a picture of what a militarization looks like? Um, the immigration system is broken across the country, uh, but we see it in a dramatic and unique way here. 
especially with the phenomenon of militarization? What does that look like in your community? Yeah. Well, it calls up images uh, for me, frankly. Um, and uh, I'm not the first to mention this. A, a senator did a few years ago. In, in a positive light, he said the, the wall between uh, Mexico and the United States is going to become as strong as the Berlin Wall. And I don't know if it really hit him what he was saying, you know. Uh, but um, uh, that, that apparently in some way is, is a model. And uh, thank God we haven't put any mines out. But um, we've done just about everything else. And, um, you know, there are situations uh, where, where a wall might be needed. <laughs> but, uh, but not between the border of two friendly nations. And um, not in a situation where we're really basically trying to prevent people who... Um, who are fleeing to our country. Uh, those who will be able to pass, uh, to cross a wall most easily, are the ones that are uh, better fixed financially, and they're going to find ways. The narco traffickers, no problem. They just build a tunnel. They just uh, find the weakness and, and cross. But uh, it's what it's going to do is, force people out to the most dangerous regions to cross where the enforcement isn't quite so strong uh, and force them into the desert uh, along our border. And uh, I fear that we're gonna see many more people uh, paying the ultimate price for their simple desire to survive. Thank you. Uh, Bishop, can you talk a little bit about the advocacy that you're calling the, the folks here in El Paso to? Well, there are certainly a number of ways that we can be advocates. First of all, uh, by our prayer. Uh, I believe prayer has power. And um, if we're not praying on, on this situation, then we're not taking the, the strongest instrument that God has provided to, to change hearts and minds. Uh, we can advocate by our prayer. We can advocate by our presence with, with those who, who are um, immigrants and by accompanying them as Pope Francis calls us to do. But we who are citizens of this country can also advocate politically and we need to be talking to our elected representatives and the like on every level, uh, writing letters, making phone calls, being aware of legislation that we're facing. Um, for instance, on this um, uh, threat by the attorneys general to sue the federal government to force them to take away protections from, uh, from dreamers, uh, our government needs to hear from, from our citizens, from all of us. Uh, I, I really feel like uh, if, if this goes past us without a strong response, uh, there will be no limit to, to what these people can do uh, to, to harm those who are seeking refuge here in this country. Okay, uh, it looks like we've uh, come to the last question. Maybe I'll ask the final one. Uh, Bishop, you, you obviously wrote this pastoral label to the, written letter to the people of your diocese, um, but it's clear from the letter uh, and the content that you think it has resonance uh, for folks across the whole country. What do you think is the unique message that the border has, that the church, uh, the church here on the border has, being here on the periferia, on the frontera? Uh, Pope Francis has given so much attention to the theme of borders, the periferia, uh, whether they're existential or cultural, uh, religious or geographic. What do you think is the message that we on the border um, can give uh, that's important for us to lift up for the rest of the country and even the rest of the world? Well, I think in a certain way, uh, I feel blessed to be here because um, it is easy for me to see that the narrative that so many express and believe about the, about the border is patently false and far from the truth. Uh, so we can certainly help by 
by showing that there is a different narrative that a border doesn't need to be a place of confrontation, of a threat and fear uh, when they are uh, peaceful peoples that, uh, that live on, on both sides of the border. It's a place of encounter, uh, a, a place of, of enrichment, uh, a place where people are called to build bridges. Uh, on a deeper level, uh, I think that um, I found the opportunity to reflect about the, um, uh, the way that God interacts with people uh, it, it is, uh, is given a certain uh, uh, deeper meaning when we look at the reality of migration uh, among us. We see how uh, these borders in our life are present on so many levels, and we learn from the courage and faith of those who have left everything uh, except their faith in God in order to seek a better life. Uh, we, we recognize, as, as the letter seeks to point out, that um, the ultimate border is the one between us and the kingdom of God, and it's one that God has already chosen to pass and calls us to, to cross in union with him and with one another. Um, we can learn a lot from migrants, uh, and uh, it, it, not only in terms of our daily life, but, but in our overall quest uh, to be united with Christ. Uh, that, that's why I feel blessed to be here on the border. Thank you. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, we've recorded this, um, so we'll, we'll be able to get it out to you, and the Justice for Immigrants campaign is going to distribute it to their folks, too. Um, thank you very much to Faith in Public Life and for the Ignatian Solidarity, uh, to the Ignatian Solidarity Network for helping organize this. Um, it's been a long day for the bishop. He had breakfast this morning uh, with the migrant community here in El Paso uh, with priests from the parishes, um, and then had a, a, a very... Um, long and, and uh, uh, important and colorful signing ceremony where he gave uh, the pastoral letter, letter to members of the civic and religious communities. Um, so it's been a long day, but we're happy to share this with you. We'll get the message out and it's glad, we're glad to be able to uh, contribute to, to getting the voice out from the border uh, to the rest of the country and to contributing uh, to the movement for justice for immigrants. Um, yeah, and I want, I want to thank all of you who have signed in on this because I recognize so many of your names and I admire you and, and your work on behalf of, uh, of, the, of these poorest of the poor among us. Um, very grateful to you, you're, you're my heroes. So thanks, continue your work.